All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, my friend Deathmaster of the Mighty Doom Sword returns, and we chat about Frank Frazetta, of course, <laughs> Michael Whalen, Elric, Art, new music from Doom Sword, and an official announcement with fellow Metal Giants Eternal Champion. So you're going to want to listen to this till the end because Joe dropped some nuggets you'll be interested in. Anyway, thanks for listening. If you would like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And without further ado, here you go. and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Here's a platform we can jump off of, Joe. This is something uh, I'd just like to ask all the guests at the beginning of the show. Take us back in time to when you were a youngster. Were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to take that question and just flip two of the terms because then I have them in the right order. Gotcha. Chronologically, right? I think I started as a as a book reader. I got into fantasy pretty young, you know, classics, Tolkien, first of all. And then, I don't know, I, I always, I was looking for something more extreme. My mother passed me tapes of the stuff she was listening to, namely Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin. So that's what I grew up with. Four years old, we listened to Led Zeppelin. <laughs> And um, but then you know that stuff gets you so far. Then it was the eighties, and I wanted more. You know, mm -hmm. started developing this more kind of extreme personality, which is a trait of every metaler, if you wish, because it's an extreme kind of music. So it's because you want to reach beyond what mainstream culture is proposing. And so from there, reading more obscure or lesser known fantasy authors and listening to heavy metal became one thing, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, to me, heavy metal subculture is that it's not just the music, it's the whole thing, you know, the books you read and the music you listen to and the friendships you have and the way you live your life every day. For me, it was and, and heavy metal is life. The rest is like decoration. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or things I absolutely need to do to get crust of bread at the end of the month. You know? yeah. In the beginning, it was definitely a book reader. I maintain my um, favorite fantasy author is Moorcock. My favorite character, Elric. And I am very anxious to receive the very recently released. Mm, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, Citadel of Forgotten Myths. Um, I don't have it. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> it's out now, right? Like it just came out the end of last year, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I only discovered like last week. Yeah, I haven't read it myself either. I get these emails from Amazon and I read this title and went, wow, this sounds promising. And then Moorcock. Yeah, <laughs> it's really promising now. <laughs> <laughs> It was three heart attacks. But <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm waiting for it. It's my birthday at the end of the month, so I guess that's how long I'm going to <laughs> You know, it's funny that you brought up Moorcock because, uh, let's see, on the 21st, I'm recording with Michael Whalen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> Just like. Let me show you something. I have this book that was given to me years ago. It's a copy of The Vanishing Tower, a limited edition, and it's. 
got something that I am just so in awe of. It's by Page, so you have to bear with me. It's uh, Michael Whelan drawings of the various scenes of the Vanishing Tower within the book. So it just makes it absolutely stunning. I think this is not stuff that can be readily available on the internet. Yeah, I've never seen those. Incredible. What's the uh, what's the publisher? Publisher is Archville Press. Okay, I'm gonna jot that down because that looks. I'm gonna need to purchase that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's print autograph from Michael Wheel, but it's a, the closest they get to <laughs> an autograph. I'd be very curious to uh, to ask Michael a lot of questions, but um, I think I trust with the questions you have. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I'll just enjoy enjoy the chat. I don't want to pester anyone. But I will tell you something. Michael Whelan changed my metal life. Really? For sure. Because I did not know Sirith Ungle, and I only bought them because of the cover of the Little Dead. No other reason on earth other than with a cover like that, it's got to be fucking great. Yeah, they knew that as well. That's why they used it. <laughs> <laughs> I find um, I think we, we talked about this maybe in our previous chat about the um, this idea I have that there are perfect couplings between an illustrator and the artistic content it not, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a band could be right. a book. for example the Lance editions of Conan the Barbarian with the Frazetta paintings but uh, I mean one one of these couples, if not probably the best couple of all time, is Sarah Tungle with Michael Wheel. They're just, oh, <laughs> wow, how high can you go with marrying two things that go so well together? Yeah, uh, it's like Waylon and Frazetta are right there, and it's, I put those two on the same frequency, I guess. Yeah, so you name Frazetta, you tell me what minute into the chat we are, because my, my guess was four minutes. <laughs> Well, we made it 17 minutes because we were talking about Michael Whelan first. <laughs> Making a point not to make this chat about Frazetta. I guess going to circle back eventually. <laughs> yes. So book reader, meddler. And then, you know, you said uh, floor builder and troublemaker. Troublemaker then, because, I mean, I was never a criminal, so let's not pretend that I was ever anything beyond a bit of an annoying brat at that. <laughs> Uh, that's the extent of my troublemaking but you know not wanting even to get a, a proper job you know, right. or whatever because you, you had to you had to lead a metal life so what did i what did i do i got four of my friends together we bought a record shop uh it was called riffraff he owned it for for six years and I remember the thing is that was our uh, that was our local my first heavy metal shop I ever went in and I kind of said to myself I'm going to open this place one day. It, it didn't end so well, but, <laughs> <laughs> but for five or six years it was it was uh, good fun. And I remember that um, so we we had recorded the first Doomsday album in this in this place that didn't really have a name, and then the sound engineer became part of the group of people that decided to by the record shop because it was for sale so yeah we, we started to put things in motion and we decided look let's not just own a record shop let's combine forces let's also own a label and a recording studio we need a premises when we went to inspect the shop it had a basement mm -hmm. it was huge but well, not looking not not enormous but big and um, it was full of uh, garbage, but within the garbage, <laughs> there was also test pressing of rare albums, all sorts of st stuff. So it, it, we decided to clear it all up and then build a partition wall and make one half the price in the other the, uh, direction. We transferred the, um, all the equipment from the old place to the basement and we called it Conquest Studio and that's where we recorded three albums, the three following albums so raise on the horn and the battle commence and uh, money will go. while we're on the subject of doom sword why don't you just uh tell us how the reissues came to be how did that get started and what's well, coming up uh, so this is the reissue of the first album you might have seen the box mm, beautiful uh with the flag and everything 
by Chris in Rory Morris in Greece. It did a great job of it. Um, I, I didn't really have any say. I was happy with it, but uh, it was entirely uh, business entirely conducted between Underground Symphony. So as far as the reissue of the first album was can very much, I, I got told <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> And as I said, very happy. As for the demos, this goes back to 2019, when after Mark Shelton died, Oliver, the organizer, keep it through, and Brian in Manila Road, Hell Road, they they got together and they they decided, you know, we'll, we'll have a tribute, we'll make it the headliner of the entire festival, and they said let's let's invite musicians that we know Mark considered to be friends and they called me and I was extremely flattered and honored they thought of me. We decided to meet a couple of days before the gig to rehearse in person because everybody studied their own parts at home, which wasn't difficult. <laughs> really, for me, the only thing that I needed to do was not have any bits in the lyrics where I go, na, na, na. <laughs> <laughs> I knew everything. Right. Uh, I just, you know, sometimes you don't know all of the lyrics off by heart. Right. So I just had to, to make sure that I had them. We, we met. And we started playing, and I got on really well with Phil, bass player for Manila Road at the time of uh, Mark's death, uh, Phil Ross, and he owns this label called Postmortem Apocalypse. So we stayed in touch, and I can I can say that you know that it's a friendship. He's such a great guy, so serious, so committed to the cause. You know, he wanted to do something special. So we set out set out to do something special. You know, something that uh, our our intent was to release this demo in in a format that we know Doomsor, Doomsor fans would appreciate, namely a vinyl, um, but with something in it that would make it special, you know, like the biography, booklet with the biography and details that otherwise people wouldn't really be able to know and learn about us. Basically, something that was special that would motivate you to buy it and then wouldn't feel like it was a money grab. Right. Rather, just literally celebrating, giving as much to the to the buyer as possible. You know, exactly. Like rare pictures, that kind of stuff. I think it's pretty amazing the way it turned out. The, the unique kind of material that Phil uses as the as the cover, which feels like I don't know, clogs <laughs> nearly. It's very cottony feeling. Very very uh, unique. I, I didn't ever come across something like that. I thought I made it special to the last, you know, to the last detail. And to be honest, the feedback was amazing. Everyone loved it. And you know. Phil had to redo the mastering twice because we, we wanted to, to give the best possible. At the end of the day, it's a, it's a demo. You want to listen to it and you want to get the best experience possible. So we, we needed to make the best out of a, of a tape that was recorded in dreadful conditions, more dreadful equipment. I remember Guardian Angel, the first, the other founder, Doomsword. I remember in the book he said the R4 four, four track uh, recorder only had one special effect, and that was a lot of background noise. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it needed to be denoised a bit. I don't know how much it could be done, more than what we did, but we, uh, I can assure everyone what they're listening to is the absolute best we could do <laughs> after the you know the owning the um, record shop and, and studio years uh, also came the the floor floor builder in the sense that i um i managed to get into with the old owner of the shop i managed to get into uh, helping out with uh, organizing with the actual practical help with building stages and carrying equipment the logistics basically for some gigs that he was organizing and that got me to meet all these people in person like i remember at the time mid 90s my favorite band was iced earth I was just in love with all their stuff and i remember they came to, to play in italy supported by nevermore and i was mad um, i liked nevermore but i really loved sanctuary and i remember that particular time we were taking care of logistics and the shuttle that used to, the work as uh, bringing the artists from the venue to the hotel and back, it broke down. 
So I had to do it with my car, which was a right banger. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, I had John Chaffer and Warrell Dane in my banger. <laughs> and I was bringing them <laughs> to the hotel. <laughs> so, you know, if it's the equivalent of like someone saying, this, this particular person is my artistic idol. And you go, okay, no. Picture you own a banger of a car. And you're giving them a lift. <laughs> Finish. How does that feel? Completely surreal. <laughs> I'm sure they appreciated the lift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they did. They did. I did it with all the bands. I, I got to meet a fair few musicians. I also got to watch a lot of gigs for free. So, what about your parents, Joe? Were they, uh, were they involved with musically with anything? Were they involved in the arts? What were they doing? My parents. So my dad was from Naples in Southern Italy. No, he was not involved with anything, but like every Neapolitan uh, can sing very well. They're a bit like, of, like I don't know if the whole of Italy can sing, but my father could and the majority of Neapolitans can. So kind of got the tone of my voice from the, the Southern Italian kind of root. And in fact, if you think of the intro of the first album, there's that solo intro, it's just voice, right? For I am your God. That's very much inspired by a Neapolitan song. And yeah, nobody knows that. <laughs> Which one? Neapolitan song are, 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 songs are all about love. <laughs> uh, love or the sun, but most 90% love and then they're... 10% about pleasures of life. <laughs> <laughs> but not very tragic. And that intro is uh, quite uh, explicitly inspired by uh, by a love song, a, a Neapolitan love song. So that was my dad's kind of influence mm. on me. And my mother then was a, a, a good painter, but she is still a good painter. And they, they both my parents were painters, but my mother, I think. I feel was a little better. So I got my love for visual arts from uh, from that. And they pushed for me to learn the piano when I was six. So that that gave me an, an amazing foundation in terms of, you know, if you think easily of the early 80s, learning piano means, you know, learning the whole theory and very formal and strict. And, uh, you know, I was a proper gym for someone who wants to become a musician Problem is that then 10 years later, I could play the piano decently well, but all I wanted to do was plug in the guitar. <laughs> and I couldn't, and I didn't have the money to buy a guitar, so I had to earn it. So I remember that my dad said, uh, you wanna um, buy a guitar? Look, your uncle needs help there in the warehouse unloading trucks. But you go there and you get your money, no problem. In those days, this was classic Southern Italian, that's going to build character approach, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know that it built character, but I got my guitar. I was going to say you got the guitar, that's the goal. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was great. I got my first guitar, it must have, must have been something like the equivalent of $300 nowadays, 30-something years ago. You still play piano? I have a keyboard around and I am is it a terrible pun to say that I'm handy <laughs> handy with a keyboard <laughs> uh, I survived the terrible pun test <laughs> yeah I'm handy I lost a bit of I'm so kind of guitarified as a musician that I lost a bit of that multitasking ability that I had with my hands one one hand to do one thing and the other to do a completely different thing because it's the exact opposite of the guitar, where the two hands need to be absolutely synchronized. So yeah, but um, but I I'm good enough to uh, I don't know play keyboard parts and songs I write, or if we want to put a bit of keyboard part in a, in a song, I could do it. We don't normally. There's a lot of Doomsday stuff that has been written and never made it to being recorded. I think I mentioned in our pre in, in our first chat that. Uh, I might easily have another two, three yeah, yeah. Uh, Doomsday albums that never got. So, and you might... You're going to cause fans yeah. to have some gray hairs if they're listening to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're going to have pitchforks and torches at your door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it all came from uh, Manowar writing, you know, no synthesizers or whatever. But I don't think they ever meant it in a no instrument that has keys 
was ever played on the sound because there was uh, piano parts and especially in later albums i think they just meant we don't do electronic stuff problem is that we well, my group of, of friends and i would say possibly all italians took it very very literally like mm. it was you shall never have a, a keyboard in your heavy metal band. Yeah, so that's that's how uh, Doomster were just like, we are never, ever, <laughs> ever going to put a keyboard part in us. You can always start a side project if you want to go, you know, solo keyboardist or whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, <laughs> I actually have stuff for a side project. I intend to re- release it sometime because it's interesting it's interesting because it's five songs it's not even an album it's five songs and it's called night of the sorcerers i'm interested and i call it the death master project like i probably call it that <laughs> the closest thing i can think of is uh, a more 70s slightly more 70s merciful fate and it's based around the fantasy story i wrote in which all sorts of events occur in a single night uh, in which s- sorcerers wizards of every kind are up to no good but i wouldn't want to reveal too much because understood i think it, it's got an, an original twist and a- anything more i say would be a horrible spoiler but the bottom line is that the moment i do eventually manage to uh, release this and consider i wrote the first song in 2006 so it's now 17 years i said i'm going to release it. <laughs> but uh yeah it'll come out with a with a with a little book with the oh, I, I like that a bit like um what was the manila road mark shelton's uh, side project in which he ah uh, yeah okay himself off as a uh, hell well <laughs> while we're on the subject of a uh, side projects i do have a couple of questions here from a fan named from a fan named Sam, and if I don't ask him, Sam will be upset. So here we go. Sam asks, "Joe, you're gonna have to help me out. I'm probably gonna uh, butcher this pronunciation. But <laughs> will there ever be a new album of the Gallerthorn side project? Gallerhorn. Gallerhorn. Okay, there we go. Will there ever be another album? The intention is 100% there. I even wrote some stuff, but um, the logistics of it are difficult to." pull off but i'm getting to the point where i'm like you know fuck it. <laughs> uh, gonna, we all get I'm there do it by myself and and ask my because the drummer on Gellerhorn is the, the doom sort drummer who now owns a studio so if i manage to put the whole musical like the all of the instruments together and uh, then he can just add the drums i suppose like many other times when these questions were asked about doom sort or side projects the, re- the answer is yes it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when arm yourself with patience because it's doom so we're talking about it's me we're talking about and uh, <laughs> yeah, my speed is legendary <laughs> all the wrong everyone out there just be patient it's coming and another question from sam is can we expect doom Sword to ever play live again in their homeland in italy mm. yes but when so we've had people asking us to play continuously for years and years and years and so we're now 12 years overdue releasing an album and there are still people asking us to play and i've managed to basically tell everyone look we want to focus on the album so we're not going to play until we have an album out that's the first hurdle to get that album out then we can think about playing live yeah the reality is we've played three times in our history in italy and we also never played, like, the southernmost we went was Milan. Pretty far north. It's about as north as they go in terms of places where to go play. So my wish is for one day to be able to play Rome or Central Italy, so somewhere where it would suit a lot of people. We've been uh, naughty towards our Italian <laughs> Well, I think that answers Sam's questions. Thank you, Sam, for the... And thank you, yes course just to backtrack a little bit joe obviously you're a painter you're a writer musician when you go back to being a kid when do you start experimenting creatively which one comes first i always drew continuously mm. you know, when your desk in school is completely covered in doodles <laughs> that was me and that considering i started school six years of age and immediately 
I started learning the piano, I would say music and, and art came at the same time, six years of age. But the thing is, they've never been my primary occupation because it turned out I was pretty good at, at maths and science. So immediately, like your parents, or at least my parents, would never say, off you go to art school, <laughs> <laughs> become a painter, you know. <laughs> No way. So it was the it was a more scientific direction I took. While I thought I was always decent at it, I also never made it my primary sort of activity. Uh, but but I but I do want to acknowledge the fact that you know while my parents were trying to think about me and my career and being able to hold a steady job, they also very much encouraged me to nourish my artistic side. They never got in the way. They just stopped at the point where, you know, no, you're not going to art school. Other than that, if you want colors, <laughs> I'll buy them. <laughs> yeah, very, very young. Six years of age. And as I said, my parents were also painters. So. And just jump into when you, have an, when you have an idea for a painting or an illustration today, do you change on the fly? If you say, like, maybe I don't like this piece here, or do you have a concrete image in your head and that's what you're trying to work to towards the end? There's both, and that's the same with, uh, with, with, with music as well. There's times where I'm very much convinced about a concept and I uh, put it down and that's it. And then other times where I keep changing because all I want to do is experiment and learn. So, for example, uh, I don't know if you see this guy. Yeah, I can see it. So that, that was my first, I, I just got a set of acrylic paints. I wanted to, to learn how to use them. Uh, so I had done this thing, I called it the mound. There's like a, yeah. a horn skull on a, on, on a mound. So then I, this was the kind of final product. So that was very much like a, a planned process. It's very rare that I would do a sketch and preliminary for painting and then on the complete opposite side, I got another set of acrylic cars. It was my first time using it. Hmm. So the first ones I was happy, but I was borrowing my daughter's cars. <laughs> <laughs> so I, just, I got my own set, and, uh, and I have no idea where it's coming from. And I changed a couple of things in it a number of times. So there's both. There you go. There's the instinctual, kind of spontaneous. There's another uh, kind of spur of the moment thing. And if you see, this guy is pretty angry. And has, yeah. Uh, what would you call it? A, a necklace in, in his hand. Uh, he has just retrieved from someone since his sword is still bloody. So I called it, that's mine. And that's the PG rated <laughs> version. Yeah, the title. As for, you know, on a daily basis, there. what I do is when, when I have sometime in the evening i'm relaxing maybe watching a show on, on netflix or what have you i would sit down and do you know all sorts of sketches and that's all while watching i don't know the walking dead that seems otherworldly to me because i i could put six hours into attempting to draw something and it would look like a kindergartner did it you know it's just this is not something <laughs> that's in my wheelhouse well, i don't consider myself to be much of a of an artist and i'll be very very honest but i give it a go and i like it which which is all that matters really but as for any aspiring artist which includes me i'm not giving advice as, a, as an accomplished artist i'm giving advice as one of you who is trying to become something I think at the basics, uh, the basis of learning, there's chunky. So you need to decompose every problem in its kind of basic units and start from there and repeat the path of the ones you admire because you won't have an identical result. You are you and the people you admire are, is, is them <laughs> and you're not them. So, and, and that's good because the, the world is beautiful because it's varied. If I think, for example, about Frazetta, he, you know, he was learning to draw and someone said, look, you're really poor on the anatomy, you need to learn it. And he got this book by uh, Bridgman called Constructive Anatomy. He studied it over one night, did it all, woke up, basically got up the next morning from his desk or whatever, wherever he was working and announced, I know anatomy, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> That's because that was Frazetta. He could mm. learn anatomy in one night. That's for, for us mortals. <laughs> we need to uh, to do the same thing, but it will take us longer. Because in the end, that's what I think is the definition of talent, is 
not your ability to learn something, but just how quickly you're going to do it. Right. That's really it. Because if you persist at it, there's no chance you're not going to learn it. And you, you are. That's what I would say. Start with, uh, start with the basics. If it's anatomy you're interested in, a constructive anatomy is your perfect starting point because it teaches you to draw figures in blocks, you know, like, mm -hmm. like they're little wooden blocks that give an idea of what the basic masses are. And you take it from there. It's the same thing as learning scales on an instrument or I don't know if you want to mention this, Joe, so we can cut this out if you don't want to, but uh, we're talking about Frazetta. I know you had some dealings with Sarah after we talked, and you guys reached something, so... Yeah, so it, it's good news, but I would say that because it's good news, I won't reveal much more. Got it. <laughs> so we'll leave it. <laughs> it's all good. I know last time we spoke, uh, you mentioned the Broken Sword. Now, I have purchased it, but I haven't read it yet. Paul Anderson... So I know you mentioned that one, but I wanted to ask you, what are some other stories that come to mind when you think about the ones that you always go back to, you know, your desert island sword and sorcery stories? Uh, funnily enough, uh, these days I do a lot of driving with the kids, dropping them to activities, and I am a, a good way to spend your time in the car is to listen to audiobooks. So I'm playing the, the whole Barsoom series to my daughter, mm. uh, John Carter, and it's... It's got to be one of the best things I've ever written in terms of how the story is so gripping. And I don't know, is it because I listen, read books, always with the mind of a painter musician that, that goes, I, I know how to put this on a canvas and what music will go with that. But I find that that, that material is very, very inspirational probably i don't know is it is it the first sword and planet difficult to say but you know it's one of them pioneering mm -hmm. so that's one definitely edgar rice Potter's uh princess of mars and all the Barsoom books are you a carl edward wagner fan so i've been skirting around wagner for a long time and never found the uh, the time to read it i know that is great because I see the paintings, Frazetta's paintings, Bloodstone, and I am I'm there going, ah, I've got to read this. <laughs> <laughs> You'll love it. I can guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know Jason in Durham Champion mentioned it to, to me. So I'm, I'm trusting your opinion and his that it's great stuff. So I definitely have to get around to reading it. But obviously, we waiting anxiously about for the Moorcock book to arrive. Um, but if you're talking about Ireland, uh, aside from the old Eric stuff, I will bring Treasure Island. I remember uh, my daughter, who's 11, also read it. Well, read a kind of a dumbed-down version uh, for primary school. And she said something to me. She said... I was a bit confused by the story because there's this villain character and he's a villain, but I like him. <laughs> and I was there, I was there going, that is the entire point of that book. Everybody loves Long John Silver. Right. And how the author managed to make the villain of the book one of the most loved characters in, in literature is just genius. I mean, he's an, an actual bastard. <laughs> But you root for him because he's, you know, he's just, his intelligence is his, his, his so charismatic, you know. And he's like the prototype pirate, you know, with one leg and one eye and parrot on the, on the shoulder. So it's uh, definitely pinnacle in terms of uh, character uniqueness and, um, and strength, you know. And, and I was actually proud of my daughter that she made that comment because that's, that's a very... Um, very on point you know that, yeah yeah that's it you're not supposed to like him but you love him. <laughs> <laughs> what was your intro into the genre of sword and sorcery obviously you know you're probably introduced to stuff like treasure island first and then when you discover it yourself what what was that uh first story if you recall the lord of the rings was my first proper sword and sorcery book or fantasy really uh robert howard came afterwards i still prefer him I think it's probably to do with the fact that, like a lot of people, I lean towards an ADHD approach towards stories, and uh, I prefer the short story to exactly. the long drawn out mm -hmm. fantasy material. In fact, I love The Hour of the Dragon, but I prefer The Scarlet Citadel. 
because it's like the short version. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. And uh, when I think about the Hour of the Dragon, I just think, look, you could have split this in two. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's my go-to Howard is Solomon Kane for that reason because most of those stories are just real digestible and real fun, short to the point. Yeah, absolutely. I love Solomon Kane. I really do. So yeah, those my formation really. Other than that, if you can call fantasy or sword and sorcery any form of mythology, because since I was a little kid, I was just mad for Norse mythology. I read them like they were bedtime stories, you know. But they're so entertaining. They're they're, they're so full of twists. They're so original. The, the imagery is so strong. I don't know why other mythologies weren't full of dragons and swords the same as as Norse mythology was. And also one one big source of inspiration for me was the general uh, Dungeons and Dragons. You know, mm. Dungeons and Dragons. It's this kind of timeless, placeless fantasy world where magic exists and you, you become less interested in the lore of of the world and just interested in the adventure actually didn't mention it up until this point but playing rpgs with my friends with metal blasting in the background <laughs> big 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 part of, of my youth what do you uh i meant to ask you this when you said it earlier but what do you think it is about moorcock and elric specifically that speaks to you so much uh, i think it's the anti-hero i love heroic tales but I don't love, you know... Good uh, guys, like you're saying, like, yeah. goody two-shoes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, that, that's kind of what, in the end, after having read so much, put me off talking a little bit. It became a little bit fairy tale. Uh, with the, There's no gray area, you know. Fairy-footed hobbit uh, being the hero. That kind of put me off. I was more into... To me, if Elric was around now, he'd be like a criminal biker. And, and that I can relate to more. Right. Um, and I think metalers can as well in general. This, I don't know if it's just me or turn out <laughs> extremely <laughs> repressed <laughs> that every other metaler is actually very confident and self assured. <laughs> and it was just me. But, um, you know, if, if you think of metalers in general, especially in the olden days, I think nowadays it's changed a lot. And the origins, metalers were like fringe of society people misunderstood you know trying to rebel against a system they didn't work for them because it only supported one way of living your life in a certain sort of path you know get a steady job find a settle down and start a family retire you know and then there was metalers people who have who actually generally have a lot of brains a lot of imagination a lot of unresolved and unexpressed creativity they yearn for more which is why fantasy works so well because it's a lot of escapism you know mm -hmm. it, to put it in a in a very dumbed down way it's like oh i wish i was a warrior <laughs> with a sword and going around killing evil wizards rather than you know stocking shed whereas it doesn't seem to be there for people who don't listen to it <laughs> because they just, just wait for friday night uh, and yeah. get pissed in the in a pub you know <laughs> uh, for us instead it was it was different it was more to do with finding finding a better world within ourselves because it didn't exist outside. right uh, it was all in in our brains that's what I try to express in the song Days of High Adventure. That, you know, when I say our weapons in our heart more than in our hands. Not really going around with swords. It's in our heart, but what we feel is really our strength, you know? That's it. I don't even know what the question was. But the Me neither. <laughs> well said. To a good place. <laughs> that was great. While we're just on writing, you know, when you're writing yourself, what does your... What does your pre-writing process look like? Do you, are you in a heavy outline or do you just like to sit down and see where things go? It can happen a number of ways. I read something I like and might write a song about it. Or if I read something I like and then I know there's a painting that exists of it, I do a lot of visually inspired compositions in that, and I think we, we touched back in our first chat on this, I have my own kind of little theory that images can be translated into music because each color and the general pace of the picture 
gives you an idea of the tempo of the song, the, if the colors are warm or, or cool, it's a different atmosphere you convey. And then, you know, where fantasy pictures like Frazetta, there's a lot of darkness and then there's these bright spots. So those, to me, are more easily represented by the high tones of a high-pitched vocal or a guitar solo or a piercing lead, you know. I can be pretty systematic about that, you know, looking at a picture and going, okay, uh, the general atmosphere is this. If you take the theater, there's a lot of stuff happening. It's very chaotic, so it suggests it's in the middle of a battle, so battles never never been slow that I know, aside from obviously the moving phase. But when we when you're in the heat of it, it suggests that there should be a lot of a lot happening from a lot of sides, you know. And then you know, it's generally very dark, but there's bright spots here and there, so you can interpret those as uh, the, the high pitched parts of your composition. That's something that comes quite natural to me if I look at a picture and go, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this into music. It's one thing that will, that might happen. Other times I start from the lyrics. I have an unfinished novel that I managed to translate parts of it into music and it is going to be included in the next album. The title might not be the most original but it does re summarize the entire novel pretty well and it's called fire iron rules yeah as i said we, we listen to it, it might might sound a, a little bit cheesy but then give it a go <laughs> once it's out uh, uh, you won't regret it and um, in a few words it's the story of a a monk during in this kind of alternative fantasy history a monk during the uh, invasion of the Longobards of Italy a monk that performs the reverse conversion mm. so goes from being Christian to pagan and in the story you'll find out why that's one source of inspiration that so out of all your uh, creative endeavors, be it a, a picture that you've painted or recording music or writing a story, which project have you undertaken that you would say has been the most challenging? Is there one that you lost the most sleep over or pulled your hair out over? The novel, because it's not finished. And I think, if I think back at early Doomsword and I think about my accent being really, really bad, being able to hear it and my musicianship being less than what I would like it to be. I personally have that tinsy bit of cringe back and go, what? <laughs> but at the time, I didn't. I was young and uh, I didn't care. And anyway, I didn't know any better. I thought right. it was good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is good. <laughs> so, you know, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> I would have pulled my hair out back then had I had the awareness I have now. But that instead is what's happening with the novel because I am now a little bit self-conscious. No, I'm not English speaker natively. I'm not. I'm writing in English. Mm -hmm. uh, am I trying to do what Italians call doing a step that's longer than your leg? So that's the bit where I'm going. I don't know. Am I a good story writer? People will think it's amateur stuff. The English of it is poor. So that's that's where I am with it. But a good song came out of it, so it's not all. All is not lost. I haven't told you face to face. Just tell you thank you for the uh, the painting of Ob. You know, my wife really oh, loved uh, it, and you know, I still have it as my cover. So I'm gonna have to get a big blow up painting of it one day and hang it up on the mantle. It's, just wanted to thank you for doing good. taking your time to do that. That was my. Um, I was experimenting with a graphic tablet. As I said, I, I do a lot of doodling during in the evening and didn't want to waste a lot of paper. Plus, you know, digital has the undeniable advantage of the undo. You can't do on paper. You can, you can undo traditionally. It's just a lot more difficult. Right. A lot more work. So it's great for prototyping, you know, for like uh, coming up with ideas and putting it together and going, I, I like this enough that I might try to put it on a canvas. Mm -hmm. But your image of old dog was so vivid. And it just came so naturally. It looks exactly how I pictured him, which is what really blew my mind when you showed it to me. <laughs> you know, it just goes to show how well you described it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> because it, we both, 
both thought the same thing. And, mm. You know, you got to give it to the description. It was extremely effective and uh, very detailed. I love this sort of creature that could, is like a god in the sense that it exists since before anybody can mm-hmm. tell. But it, it isn't a god in the sense of, in the spiritual sense of the of the word. It's right. More like an, uh, as far as we know, eternal being. That exists that, outside of our own understanding of things, you know. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. Man, that was that was some um, some piece of writing. I am telling you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. I'm glad I, you enjoyed it. I told you I am I am a fan, and no, I don't lie. <laughs> I, I, I really am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm working on a uh, origin novella, so Ooh. that's something. Yeah. Back story. Yeah, exactly. And I don't even have it. So, like, if you ask me who or what Ob is right now, I have, like, I have, I don't know. <laughs> I just have pieces of what he is, you know, and I have an idea of what he is. I have a couple short stories in which he appears, but I don't even know concretely what he is right now. He could be the antimatter counterpart of the same being named Bo. <laughs> Yes, that's what it, I'm going to let me write that down. <laughs> Bob and Ob. <laughs> the Adventures of Bob and Ob. That would be great. Uh, that's like the Gray Mouser, you know. <laughs> so, okay, uh, this is something I like. This is something I like to ask everybody, Joe. You never know what folks are going to say. So, have you ever had an experience in your life that you would consider supernatural or paranormal? I obviously it could have been anything, but um, we were having we were grilling meat near this church, which is right slap bang in the woods. It's kind of a sanctuary, and we made it a habit of um, going there with some chopped wood digging a hole in the ground and burning some wood and then cooking the, the meat on the on the on the embers you know? mm-hmm. and because it was pine wood actually it gives meat an amazing flavor nearby there was like an opening pa- the place is spooky on a good day you know? <laughs> and i don't know why i ventured off but i did and it was completely dark there was absolutely no artificial light all around was covered. It's basically forests everywhere, except for this kind of opening, flat opening uh, with a grass meadow. And I swear I saw what looked to me like a kind of a procession that didn't last very long. And it was a, a figure with could have been like a. To my mind, it was like a flaming torch, you know. Mm-hmm. But it lasted far too short for it to be like it. it if there was a physical group of people doing that, then why the heck were they in the woods <laughs> doing that? But if if it was, they could not have disappeared that fast. So that's the only time. But uh, I do have to come with with a big disclaimer of the quantity of alcohol that was consumed. <laughs> um, I do not discount just a plain senior moment. You know, having said that, even though I might have been a little bit merry, I think if it was the alcohol, I wouldn't remember it so well. So yeah, that would be that would be my. Just to put a bow on everything before we wrap up here, what's on the horizon for you? You know, the mob's gonna come after me if I don't look at you and ask, "What's the update on a new album?" <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask. <laughs> I would like to say we are recording. Uh, there's definitely people in the process of entering a room with instruments <laughs> and recording music. This is happening right now. So that what that also means is obviously the songs are done. And they are, there might be a little bit of work on them while we are in the studio, but the songwriting is done. The lyrics are written, melodies are there. It's just a matter of um, getting it done. At the same time, uh, I don't know if I'm saying this as a, as a kind of a wishful thinking more than anything. Recording an album should never be a long process because uh, it it starts, it's like overworking a painting. You, you end up ruining it. It should be like enter, record it. You can give it a second pass later on, but never let it linger and fester. And it, it goes bad, it goes off. It's like, <laughs> oh, milk. don't, don't do that. Exactly. Uh, especially because you, you lose the moment in time when you were doing that. It becomes uh, sp- spread over a number of periods and your mentality changes, your your you change, and nothing good's going to come of uh, that process. Mm-hmm. you got an album, 
go ahead and record it. So that's what, what we're trying to do. And uh, since you mentioned his name earlier, I'm not going to elaborate any further, but I'm just going to say, Jason, anything there? Or you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is, there is a, a, a little surprise coming. Things are going much slower than I would like them to, uh, because at this point, uh, getting the damned album is our absolute priority, because it was two years ago I announced that we were done with songwriting with the kind of basic drafts of the songs that we were going to work on them as a band and prepare them for recording. And I know we had our fair share of uh, incidents and, and mishaps uh, that delayed things out of our control. But we're, you know, at this point, we already got to go, you know, enough excuses. I know people get injured. I know the weather gets bad, but we've got to record this. But that's it. There is something coming with us and Eternal Champion, and um, it's definitely happening. It's going to be absolutely great. That's what we're looking for. All right, man. Well, Joe, let's not wait another two years before we uh, chat again. <laughs> but I'm going to let you go get some dinner. I know you're probably tired. Yeah, well, but that's that's a kind of a always. <laughs> I, got a, I got this disease called kids. Uh, <laughs> Listen, Justin, thanks a million for having me. Always a real pleasure talking to you. I'm looking forward to uh, more of your material. I'm probably going to hold this until after I release Michael Whalen. So, because sure. I just mentioned it. So, of course, when I release it, people are going to be like, where's Michael Whalen? You know, so, I'll just. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll send this down the pipeline when it's ready. Very good. Brilliant stuff. Uh, thanks a million, Justin. All right. And, thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, don't, don't be a stranger. Yeah? For sure. You have a good night, man. You too. All right, folks, that's a wrap. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs>